The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Today, I'm going to ask you a lot of questions because uh, there's, there's a lot of very interesting intuition that connects up with the periodic table. And I think you want to be uh, answering questions of that nature. So the goal. Take the 9 a.m. lecture to ask a lot of questions. Of course. <laughs> Well, you know, people are tired, so their inhibitions are down, oh, okay. and they're willing to say stupid things that they might not say at 5 o'clock on, uh, on an afternoon. Okay, so the goal here is understanding spectra. And we under, want to understand spectra because we want to learn something from the spectra, not just because, you know, it's the daily crossword puzzle and we have to do it to, to keep from developing Alzheimer's. I mean, that's people my age, that's what you're told, you've got to do that sort of thing. Um, the goal is to learn about what's unique about that, the system in question, which is the, uh, something about the intramolecular potential, whether it's the uh, vibrational potential or it's the, what does the electron feel as it approaches the atom or molecule. And so, the whole goal of spectroscopy is to, is to find out about the wave function, the form of the potential, but in order to do that, one has to know what the spectrum is going to look like, know how to find critical patterns in it. Uh, and so one of the critical patterns has to do with electronic structure, and it also makes direct connection to uh, what we learned in freshman chemistry about the periodic table. And so I'm going to uh, be asking a lot of questions about the periodic table and simple concepts like that. So the goals for today uh, are going to be, uh, we have the one electron spectrum, which we talked about before, and we have the alkali. Uh, spectra where you have one electron outside of a spherical closed shell. And this difference is basically all you really need in order to understand the periodic table, or at least the way we asked our freshmen to understand the periodic table. So almost all of the freshman chemistry insight comes at this point. Um, and the other main goal is that we're going to have I'm going to explain where this scaling comes from using a semi-classical uh, argument for Rydberg series and for many other things as well. So this, this is a really important idea. Okay, so we can draw a cartoon of an atom. We have a filled shell and we have an electron outside the filled shell. And so we want to understand how that's going to be expressed in the spectra of alkali-like atoms. And the important thing is that when the electron is outside of the filled shell, it, looks, it sees something that looks like hydrogen. And if the electron penetrates inside of the filled shell, it looks like it's, it sees something that has a larger charge. And so its wave function is pulled in, toward, uh, uh, the nodes get closer together, it's stabilized, there are all sorts of ways of thinking about that, and all of this is the crucial uh, for understanding uh, electronic spectra of atoms and molecules. So let's begin, I'm going to just write down the effective potential for, an, uh, for uh, uh, an atom, and so that we have Z, E over R with a minus sign plus L, L plus 1 over 2 mu R squared. So this is the uh, uh, radial potential that an electron sees when it's on an atom. 
and uh, um, this is exactly correct for a one electron atom. And we want to use this idea for many electron atoms. And so the uh, first question I'm going to have to ask you is, how do we estimate the ionization energy for atoms and molecules using the ideas in this equation and the Rydberg equation? The Rydberg equation says the ionization energy minus the actual energy, in other words, the binding energy of the nth orbital is equal to uh, the Rydberg constant over n squared and with a factor indicating the, the charge on the nucleus here. So I like to know, I like to uh, uh, say uh, that I'll never forget this number because this number sets the scale for ionization energies of everything. But how do we use this equation and this number to predict the ionization energy of anything? I mean, when we, if we are talking about hydrogen, we know the ionization energy is from n equals 1, uh, um, n equals 1 to infinity, and so we just get z squared, which is 1 for hydrogen times the Rydberg. So the ionization energy for hydrogen is 110,000 wave numbers. If you're in the n equals 2 level of hydrogen, then it's this divided by 4. And so is the ionization energy of stuff typically 27,000 wave numbers? If you're in the second row of the periodic table and you start with n equals 2. It's definitely larger than that. So how, does, how, do, how do we make the ionization energy? Use this, this constant and this equation. How do we generalize this in order to explain ionization energies, but in a way that doesn't leave us completely free to say, well, it could be a million wave numbers or it could be two wave numbers. That, that we want to be able somehow to get these things right. And what do we do in freshman chemistry to explain, what are the, pro you know, the, the properties we explain in freshman chemistry are what? Ionization energy, electron affinity, size, uh, electronegativity. But we have you know, a nice way of uh, explaining the trends in these things relating to the shell structure, you know, fill, we fill in orbitals, and we also have this business that uh, 4S fills before 3D, but 4S ionizes before 3D. In other words, before you have 3D, 4S is lowest. After you have a 3D electron, 4S is the highest. And so how do we e explain the trends in these things and this sort of idea as freshmen, where we don't know quantum mechanics? Uh, what are the key concepts that enable us to use all these equations? Yes. You fudge the effective, you fudge the nuclear charge. Right, shielding. So that's the main thing you do. And you develop ideas for how does one kind of orbital shield the nuclear charge from other kinds of orbitals. Now that's really self-consistent field, uh, but we don't ask people to do Hartree-Fock as freshmen. We ask them to somehow say, okay, what kind of charge is the electron going to see based on the states of all the other electrons. And it doesn't take too much insight in order to use these concepts well enough to get almost everything right. So we have shielding, and that comes from this. Because when L is zero, 
the electron sees a potential that looks like that. So that's uh, an s orbital. And when l is not zero, it sees a potential that looks like that. And so for l equals zero, the electron can get really close to the nucleus. So s orbitals are pretty good. Uh, they're going to get very in close and they're going to shield anything with a larger principal quantum number and they're going to partially shield p orbitals. And uh, so these sorts of ideas of shielding enable us to explain or at least after the fact rationalize almost everything that one sees in the periodic table. So we're going to have two ideas here. One is we're going to, let, we're going to talk about Z effective. What am I? I think I, Z effective, and uh, the Z effective is going to depend on uh, which orbital we're talking about, and it also depends on what other orbitals are occupied. And we're also going to generalize to n star from n. We're going to have two different knobs we can adjust. And uh, so both of them are doing more or less the same thing. They are saying when the electron is out here, it sees a charge of 1. When it's in here, it sees a charge larger than 1. But the ability to get inside the core depends on L. And so there are going to be two ways in which we're going to uh, dress up the hydrogenic equations in order to rationalize everything. And you'd say, well, why two? And that's because there are two kinds of properties. Uh, there's uh, fine structure, and there's, uh, oh, well, I'll just call it gross structure. The, the fine structure is, you know, has a 1 over r cubed. Or one, or, you know, it's it's near the core. And the growth structure is mostly outside. And so, if we're going to try to understand uh, the uh, energy levels of states, we're going to need two different things: one knob to adjust the spin orbit, say, and one knob to adjust the energy levels. And so, we we are going to play games with the effector charge and and star. I said I would ask questions, but I, I, I answered them all. So anyway, you, you're lucky. Okay, so let us now go back to the notes and uh, uh, let me, oh, I do have a question. Suppose we have a one electron spectrum. And so the spectrum you, you record the spectrum of hydrogen or some one electron atom. And so you see a series of transitions and how do you know what you've got? Are there any things in the spectrum that jump out at you and say, oh, I've got to, uh, I've got a, a reference point that will enable me to assign the spectrum? I mean, suppose you have you have a, a spectrum and it's a one electron uh, spectrum, but you don't know whether it's hydrogen or helium plus or lithium two plus or you know, something like that. I mean, that you'd never have, it, that's too crude, you would know. Uh, but what would be the characteristic features in a spectrum? And suppose it's an emission spectrum, so as opposed to uh, an absorption spectrum. In an absorption spectrum, everything is from the ground state. That makes it trivial. But if it's an emission spectrum, then there are going to be all sorts of overlaid patterns. And how do you know what to look for? Well, one of the things you're going to see, that's too crude. So you're going to see a series of lines getting closer and closer together and also getting weaker, a convergence. And this tells you there's going to be a convergence here. And so, 
if you have a, a feature in the spectrum that just yells out at you that there's a, a series of transitions getting closer and closer together, that's an anchor. It says they're converging to ionization and there's going to be a pattern that you can use to, to work backwards to make assignments of everything. Does an atomic emission spectrum have to get monotonically weaker as you get closer to the continuum? No, there are all sorts of, uh, uh, there's all sorts of kinetic processes that can produce weird things. Uh, but uh, um, there is a, uh, a scaling rule on uh, um, if, if all of the upper levels are equally populated and you're looking at transitions to, uh, um, to a lower state, there will be this decrease in intensity because the transitions get weaker for reasons that I'm going to explain today. So I, you, I'll get to you in a second. I mean, you want to look for patterns, but sometimes the patterns are going to be distorted because of something interesting. You know, one, you might find that one of these lines is really strong. That's telling you, boy, you better do something about that because that's, uh, that's going to tell you something about a kinetic process which you might be interested in. Okay, your question. Um, you would also see this convergence in molecular systems too, right? Absolutely. As you're approaching some. Whenever you take an electron, far away from something, it the electron thinks it's on hydrogen. And so it changes its energy levels to resemble those of hydrogen. And sometimes it has some extra stuff. And you have to somehow not see that or deal with it to uncover the pattern. So the bigger the molecule and the more complicated the system, the more decoding you have to do. But at the core, you're going to be looking for something like that. And you have to be willing to allow for uh, 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 p patterns that get broken. So, you know, it's, it is not a trivial thing to assign and interpret a spectrum. And there are all sorts of wonderful ways in which you can get off the track. Uh, but um, you, you have to be looking for fragments of patterns. Or you have to be looking for some way that you say, I know what's going on here because I've sampled two, uh, something two different ways or I see something that's unmistakable. Could you use like a, like a Rydberg spectroscopy of sorts to kind of get an idea of what, let's say you have like a diatomic or something. Yes. Um, could you then use whatever you see, like what you expect versus what you see to kind of give you an idea of what that molecule shape looks like? Because it's no longer, say, like circular so that Rydberg, those Rydberg interactions aren't going to, are going to be different. So then you might be able to extract something about the shape. Absolutely. I mean, for example, uh, well, one kind of shape is how, uh, how, uh, uh, what is the radial structure of the core, and so that results in differences between uh, S, P, and D. It leads to quantum D for these different values of n star, how much they're different. But if the core is not round, then the uh, the degenerate L's split into, say, sigma, pi, and delta for a D, and the splittings among them are telling you something about the, uh, the crystal field or the, the not roundness of the core. So, yes, you can always get that kind of information, and, uh, uh, and sometimes knowing it enables you to, uh, to make some sense of what the spectrum is. So, it, this is a, it's a beautiful question. So, convergence is one thing that would help you to see where you are. If you look at, say, one of these lines, it might be split into some hyperfine structure, which has to do with the interaction of the electron with the nuclear spin of one of the atoms. And that hyperfine structure is often large if the, there's a single electron in an S orbital outside of closed shells, or it, because then that electron, why, why does that matter? Because of this. The S can penetrate into the core, the P can't. 
So the S can get really close to the thing that it's, that it's feeling and producing the splitting. Uh, or it can be due to uh, the uh, quadrupole moment of a nucleus. That means the nucleus isn't round. And how do you feel something that's not round? Well, you use something that's not round, like a p orbital. And so uh, th there are these details that appear on each line that can also tell you something about what is the nature of that state. And you don't ever hear about this in textbooks. You know, you get a spectrum and, or you get tables and, and you know, you're supposed to say, oh yeah, of course. Okay, so another way of knowing what you've got is to say, well, what do I expect? And so, what do I expect? You use really crude ideas of orbitals and filling, just like what, filling of orbitals, just like what you would do in freshman chemistry, with maybe a little more sophistication. And then, once you have a level diagram, you simplify things by saying, well, what are the selection rules? Which are going to be the strong transitions? And then you have a more or less complete picture that says, okay, what could this be? And so there are lots of tools that you're going to get from me tell, you know, enabling you to, to deal with a spectrum. But the purpose of the spectrum is really to learn about the, uh, the, the structure, the potential energy curve, or the, you know, the uh, electronic structure, the, the not uh, sharp-edgedness of this thing. Okay. So, so on the basis of uh, this equation, I come back to you. What would you expect to be the typical ionization energies for atoms in the first uh, it, it, well, I guess it's the second row of the periodic table, lithium to uh, neon. Um, so, I mean, if they all start, their, their, uh, their highest uh, energy partly filled shell has n equals 2. So, if one was just naive, we, you know, we would, and use this equation, we would say that they roughly have ionization energies of 25, 27,000 wave numbers, or something like that. But we know that's not true. Wait, well, why would it come out as, as 27,000? Because this is four. Right, but doesn't uh, Z change for a Yeah, yeah, okay. So there's going to be an increase of Z, and there's going to be this greater penetration of S and so there will be different things, but, and so you, you're going to have rules for how does Z effective increase as you increase the charge on the nucleus. It increases in steps of one, and first you add S orbitals, which don't shield each other very well, and then you add P orbitals, and so on. You go up and you make some empirical rules for how the different orbitals shield, and so you have a pretty good idea how this is going to evolve. And then there's going to be some rules uh, based on this, uh, you know, the penetration versus less penetration, and that enables you to say something about n star. And so, you know, you could probably say, pretty good estimate that across the whole second row of the periodic table, you're dealing with something around 50,000 wave numbers, and then there'll be structure having to do with uh, S versus P and uh, the trend as you go up in charge and shield imperfectly. So anyway, th th that's all I really wanted to say. Okay, so here is an energy level diagram for the effective potentials that depend on L, and let's say here's a, a potential for uh, an L equals one orbital. 
So it doesn't, it, it doesn't go into the core. And here is an effective potential for an L equals zero. It's going to go way, way down. And uh, there are two choices we can use. We can draw a potential which is z e squared over r. In other words, if the atom were bare and had only one electron, it would be seeing the full charge. Or we could draw a potential uh, which is like this, where it's just e squared over r, where it's seeing a charge of 1. Okay, so these are the two zero order models. Reality is going to start here because when the electron is outside, it sees a charge of 1, and somehow it makes its way over to this. As the closer it gets to the core, it starts to see more and more charge. So the real curve is more attractive than the simple uh, one electron curve. Okay. And now you have shell structure. And so you can, you can sort of draw a picture of what would be uh, Z effective of R versus R. And so here's Z of the ion core. We have two electrons. And so then, you know, then two more, and then maybe some more. And so it has structure, and eventually it gets down to one. And so the different L's are going to be sampling this uh, radially depending structure in different ways. And so one way of learning about this core structure would be to do XPS spectrum and just ionize out of there. Or you could throw s orbitals, p orbitals, d orbital electrons in those uh, at this nucleus, and they will each sample this structure differently. And by doing the sampling, you will eventually build up a picture of what's going on. Okay. So scattering. gives insight into the core. So the difference between hydrogenic systems and non-hydrogenic systems is for hydrogen there is no core. It's just a point charge. It's not interesting. For non-hydrogenic systems, alkalis and other, there's stuff, stuff in there and it's interesting, it's different. We don't know. We, have to, we could do a calculation, but we want to be able to either observe experimentally or have some, some concepts that are more than just bullshit concepts, things that enable us to actually uh, learn about the core structure and uh, build a model that explains everything. So uh, let's just draw a toy potential. Uh, indicating that there is a region of very, uh, 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 that the potential curve or the, the potential energy, at, okay, so we're at this energy. In this region, the electron has huge kinetic energy because the potential is very small. And in this region, the kinetic energy is decreasing. And uh, so, uh, can we use a model like this to enable us to understand what's going on? Okay, if we have a model like this, you all know about particle in a box. And the energy levels are far apart and they get farther apart as you go up. And, uh, um, and so you could imagine if you're looking at core structure, you could, you, could, you could learn something about the inner part of the potential, and the levels are far apart. Okay. Uh, so this would be a way of modeling the spectra, but it's, it's, it's not that good a, a model. But one important thing is, Suppose we're sampling at this energy and at that energy, two different energies, and the potential is very, very low. In other words, there's a huge kinetic energy. 
do these two levels have a structure in the core region that is different? What do we know about uh, uh, the way, uh, uh, what did Mr. De Broglie or De Broglie say about this quantity, the wavelength? HLP. Right? And uh, so this, this kinetic energy is P squared over 2m. And so we can get P from this. And what does a wavelength mean? Well, you know, we, a wave looks like this. And so from here to here is a spacing of nodes. And so if we know the momentum, we know how far apart the nodes in the wave function are. This is true. Now, there are ways in which you can make it more complicated. But it's basically true. If you have a potential, uh, you start, especially if it's an infinite potential, you start at zero and you propagate your wave function and uh, you, you can calculate where the first node is and less well the second node. But basically, you know, the, these are simple you know, numerical integration of the Schrodinger equation or a simple concept. If the classical momentum were constant, then you know exactly where the nodes are. Now, the important thing is that the energy levels go as uh, 1 over n squared, or a constant over n squared. They get closer and closer together. And so, let us say we start at n equals 6. Well, that's the Rydberg over 36. And suppose now we go to n equals uh, 60. Well, that's the Rydberg over uh, 3600. Well, this is, uh, so this is, th the Rydberg over 36 is th uh, uh, 3,000 wave numbers, and this is th uh, 30 wave numbers. Yes? Just going back to this again, um, so if you know the momentum, then if you can reconstruct the nodes, then don't you essentially, if from the nodes, can't you then pull out the wave function? Absolutely, up until the point where things get complicated. For this, it's not complicated at all. You, have, you can solve this problem from what you've either done before you came to MIT or what you will do in 573 because these, this you know, particle in a flat bottom box or a linear potential, those are easy. And whenever you solve these problems, you always worry about boundary, you know, joining things at, at th and boundary condition at infinity. Okay, so all of these, these sorts of problems you know how to solve. And so it's nice to build up a, a problem uh, uh, relating molecular or electron, uh, atomic structure to problems you can solve. But the crucial simplification is, oh, where is it, uh, the, that we want to know IP minus uh, the energy. And so the IP is a very large number, or really, the, the kinetic energy of the electron is a very large number here. Because it's not seeing just Z of 1, it's, see, it's inside the core. It's seeing Z of whatever the charge is on the nucleus. And so there is a core region where uh, the kinetic energy is huge, and the difference between the Rydberg over 30, uh, 36, which is 3,000, versus uh, uh, 30. Uh, so this is 3,000 wave numbers below the ionization energy. Or, uh, and, and so you've reduced, say, 100 times the Rydberg, if there's a charge of 10 here, uh, by 3,000 wave numbers, which is nothing. And here you reduced it by even less. So my point is that once you're uh, the wave functions in this region for states with principal quantum numbers six or higher, they're not changing. And you can actually carry that down much lower. But the, so the internal structure of the wave function is the same for all members of a Rydberg series. The nodes are the same distance apart, and the only thing that's different from one state to the next is the amplitude in the inner region. And how, and how do we know that? Well, we know that 
the, the electron is going really fast in this core-like region. And, it, and the whole argument is it spends the same, same time going in and out here. But the period of, uh, or how long it takes for the electron to go in from its turning point here and back out, that gets longer and longer as you go up in principal quantum number. So you're asking, well, what is the probability of finding the electron in here? And so that's going to be related to the fraction of time it spends inside relative to the total period. Okay, now, where do we get the period from quantum mechanics? We know, we know uh, that the, uh, uh, for a harmonic oscillator, the energy levels are h bar omega v plus a half. We know that the period of the levels, uh, the period for a harmonic oscillator is independent of excitation energy. And we learn from this that the period is related to uh, h over, uh, well, the period is 1 over nu. And what's new? C over lambda. <laughs> uh, it, that's the difference in energy levels. Uh, so we have H over uh, E n minus. Oh, let's do this list. Okay, so I want to build up a formula that uh, I can generalize. So if we want to know the period at energy E n, we take the levels on either side of En, divide by 2 to get the average spacing, which for the harmonic oscillator is just omega, h bar omega. And so we, we do this, and from the level spacing, we can determine the period. So the general rule for quantum mechanical periods is that you take h over uh, the, for it, whether it's a harmonic oscillator or not, you say we, we, we want the period at uh, quantum number n, we use this formula. So this is a kind of a semi-classical idea. We're taking quantum mechanics, energy level spacings, and we're saying, well, there's motion. Well, there isn't motion in quantum mechanics. There's probability amplitude. We're using classical ideas to get probabilities. So we know uh, that uh, fraction of time inside over period of oscillation. So this is going to be related to the probability of finding the electron in the core. And so the amplitude of the electron in the core, which is the wave function, is going to be the square root of this. Okay, well what about this? What is the period? Uh, um, so if we take the Rydberg equation and uh, we calculate um, Well, that's going to be the same thing as taking the derivative, the energy with respect to n. And so we get 2 Rydberg over uh, um, n cubed. The Rydberg equation is r over n squared. The energy difference, especially at large n, is just going to be 2 times the Rydberg over n cubed. So the the difference in energy is this. We want 1 over the difference in energy. So this is going to be proportional to um, uh, the period is going to be proportional to n cubed. Okay. All right. So this is, uh, this energy difference is 1 over n, oh good, yes, okay. The energy difference is 1 over n cubed, 
and uh, 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 we want the period, which is 1 over the energy, and so we're going to get n cubed here. We're going to get a number here, which doesn't change with n. Okay, so now if we want the amplitude of the core, that's just going to be the square root of the probability. Okay, so we got an n cubed in the denominator, we're taking the square root, we have n to the minus 3 halves. So we know that for all Rydberg states, the amplitude in the core scales as 1 over n to the 3 halves. Now, we have matrix elements. Uh, one, some operator, two. And this goes as 1 over n1 to the minus 3 halves. This goes as 1 over n2 to the minus 3 halves. And so we know how matrix elements are going to scale. Or expectation values are going to scale. So an expectation value is going to scale as 1 over n cubed. Uh, matrix elements are going to scale as 1 over the first n times 1 over the second n, that quantity to the 3 halves. And so that's telling you how transition amplitudes are going to scale, and that's why I drew the, the amplitudes decreasing. So this simple idea of the electrons moving really fast when they're close to the core because they're seeing a z effective, uh, a z of the, the charge on the core versus slowly outside leads to this scaling the, and, and what happens is all states with, which belong to the same orbital angular momentum belong to the same series. They have uh, the same scaling law. Uh, states with a different series, they start out at, uh, uh, they don't sample the core quite the same way, but because S could get all the way in, P doesn't get in quite so far, and so you can uh, say, okay, there'll be Rydberg series, they all scale in the same way, but N is, uh, the, the effective principal quantum number is different for each of them you get n star, the effective principal quantum number that you use in the scaling is n minus delta of L, where this is a, this is a fudge factor called the quantum defect. Not a fudge factor. I know, but I'm, a, I'm about to, you, you stepped on my punchline. Sorry. It looks like a fudge factor because we're, we're, we're saying there's going to be an L dependence in how is the effect, the, this principal quantum number different from the integer. We know already that it, you know, uh, the, the, the difference is going to be larger for S than for P, but there's more to it than this. Now we're sort of doing quantum mechanics. We have this wave function. When it hits this uh, turning point, it's going, into, uh, it's going into forbidden territory. The wave function has to go to zero at infinity. And when it's outside the core, it's seeing the core as if it were hydrogen. So once the interesting stuff is, is finished, the electron is going to infinity and it has to have the right phase in order to go to zero at infinity. And since everybody comes out of the core with the same phase, because they had the same nodal structure, uh, that uh, uh, that there is a phase shift associated with a particular value of the orbital angular momentum. And so that turns out to be the quantum defect. And so the quantum defect 2 pi times this delta L is what happens when this electron goes in to the core, it comes out, and it's the, rel it's, it's the phase relative to what it would have been if it were a bit an empty, if it were hydrogen. And so when you, when you say phase shift, with respect to what? Well, with respect to a bare core. 
So all of the unique stuff comes into uh, in this. It is a phase shift. The wave function, once it's leaving the core, once it's in the, well, once it's left the core, or once it's in the forbidden region, it's seeing a charge of one. It's universal. And they're all the same. They all start at the same phase. And so you end up uh, uh, getting this incredible simplification. Now, there's this phrase, ontology recapitulates phylogeny. And this is not true. For ontology is the development of the organism from a single cell to the mature uh, uh, organism. And there is, or there was believed that the development of the organism from a single cell to the mature organism uh, replicates or mirrors the development, the evolutionary development of the organism. And there are certainly parallels, but in Rydberg states, this is the truth. If you have a Rydberg series, the internal part of the wave function for every member of the Rydberg series is exactly the same. They have the same nodal structure. The only thing that's different is the amplitude. So for Rydberg states, and for a lot of spectroscopy, ontology does recapitulate phylogeny. Uh, and uh, so uh, all different Rydberg states are built on the same, you know, have, all members of a series have the same core. And I think that's really beautiful. And am I, I still have, a, no, I'm, I'm, I'm out of time. Okay, so that was the point. That was the beginning of quantum defect theory, that we combine simple ideas uh, of uh, um, s classical mechanics with some minimal quantum mechanics, and we're forced to make a conclusion about how things scale overall and what's the nodal structure and grouping of things, uh, grouping of states together. And I think that this is really a stunningly beautiful and surprising result. And there was very little error. You know, I didn't do any differential equations. I just said, okay, by analogy to uh, classical objects, we can say there's a period of motion in quantum mechanics that comes from energy level differences. And I, I compare the period of the one oscillation to the time it spends in the interesting region. We get amplitude scaling and uh, it's, there wasn't much there. I certainly will do this more rigorously later. Yes? So let's go back to the second row of the periodic table. Yeah. And if we look at the ionization energies going from lithium to neon. Yes. They go from like five something EV to 25 something EV. Yes, well, not 25, I don't think. Or 20 EV years. You've got the, your, your yeah, Wikipedia. Yeah, I, I, I think neon's pretty high. Yes, it is, but it's not nearly as high as helium, so that. Uh, okay, yeah, right, right. Uh, helium's 21. Yeah. I'm looking it up as we speak. Yeah, so, well, finish your question. Okay. I, so, <laughs> um, sorry, 15. No, 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 sorry. Can I ask a question while I was that up? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> See? So, I thought, so maybe I'm misremembering, but I thought the phase shift was pi times the quantum defect. Now. Probably is. Okay. Sorry about that. That's, that's all right. Okay. So, so my question now, 21.5 do you mean? Mm -hmm. Okay. So what do you do to actually determine the Z? Do you be effective, if you want to really calculate this, do you do something like? Well, what you could do for neon is uh, suppose you have uh, the ground state of neon would be 1s squared, 2s squared, uh, 2p6. Right. And the first excited state will be 2p5, 3s. Sure. Open shell here. Right. Spin orbit. Spin orbit that tells you z effective for uh, the uh, p orbital. Uh, you can also then go to a higher excited state, 3p. Now you have two open shells, but you can, you can determine the spin orbit associated with 3p as well as 2p. And you use those to determine z effective. 
for the, the P. So for L not equal to zero, you can use spin orbit to determine the Z effective for that particular orbital. Okay, so from a spin orbit coupling constant, which you, one can measure spectroscopically, yeah. you can then determine the Z effective. You, you, you're going to try to build a, a, a model which has both Z effective parameter. I, I, so, so is Z you, effective in terms of L or? Okay, we have a Z effective of R. And we're going to take expectation values of it. And so we'll end up getting Z effective NL. Okay, and that's equivalent to what's called effective core potentials. So that you, uh, you take the energy levels, everything you know about a few energy levels, and you, uh, you use that to determine the radial charge distribution. Uh, and that's Z effective. And then everything is, so yes? So you said that, that for a Rydberg series, the nodal structure is the same inside the core, and that they also need to have the right phase to go to zero at infinity. Right. How are they still orthogonal to one another with those restrictions? That's actually how they get to be orthogonal. So the wave functions uh, in the core all have, have overlap integrals that are uh, uh, the same but with a scaling. And the out part, outer side part then is what makes them different because you, you basically, uh, you, each new state has an extra lobe and so that it, it turns out that's all you need to make everybody orthogonal. So they build, up, they build a positive overlap inside the core region and then it's canceled. It's, right? it's well, dead on the first uh, yeah, that's why oscillation. That's channels in the core. Yeah. Okay, so I mean, the, there are all sorts of complicated things that can come about when the electron comes in and scatters off the core, but the, it's built on a very simple structure. And that's what I wanted you to see before we do any real calculations. I don't think we'll really do too much. Okay, so, yes? Just one last thing. Um, so, for that delta L then, um, yes. I guess I'm trying to make sense of it in terms of our E is proportional to one over this n star squared, mm -hmm. right? So, if delta is large. Well, delta isn't large. Delta is on the order of one. You know, it's, it's on the order of a tenth for a d orbital and a half for a p orbital and one for s. But it's also modulo pi, you know, the phase shift is, uh, you, know, you know, what does it mean to have a phase shift more than pi or two pi? So it turns out that delta can be large, but it really matters only between, you know, for the zero to one region of delta. So I guess I'm trying to just make sense of the limits of delta, like, uh, so a large phase shift would mean that you you have a a system that is scattering very differently from what hydrogen would be. That's right, okay. uh, because uh, you know nothing could be more different than a charge of one versus two or one versus ten, and S can get all the way in and see that charge versus the charge that's not one. And, and so it's going to have the biggest phase shift, the biggest difference from hydrogen. Uh, and you know that the phase shift would be largest for S, smaller for P, and so on. But if the phase shift is larger than pi, then you start over. And it just means that the S series are, are going to be interleaved with the P and D series in surprising ways sometimes, because sometimes that phase shift in fact, very quickly, it is larger than one. Yes. And one last question today. Yes. So we use uh, the fact that different orbitals have different shapes and penetrate yeah. into the core in different ways to learn something about the core. Yes. By this sort of and and you know and then thus when you talk about it like that, it seems natural to think about a scattering picture because you're sort of scattering electrons that are constrained by these orbitals. In the yes. Yeah. Now, if we had a magic, a magic tunable X-ray laser mm -hmm. that could, you know, work just as easily as our visible lasers, but in the bands that are directly in the core. Yes. Could we learn things, the same things, more easily by doing that? 
or is there something really special that one can learn, even if you had a magic laser, that you learn by using these sort of strange scattering approach in studying? Well, the zero, you know, the zero order picture is based on this radial structure in the core. Uh, and so it's not that hard using, it's not x-ray lasers, but it's not that hard to learn about the structure of the core that way. But then there is details. The core is not just uh, a continuum. And there's the scattering of the electron. The electron comes in, hits the core electron, scatters the core electron out. And now you have two things that are outside. And so there's all sorts of subtle multi-particle interactions. So it, you know, there's always more. But you know, if you can get the big picture by a crude experiment, then it, it helps to constrain the, uh, the subtle experiment. Okay, so, uh, and, and that's one of the beauties. You do want to bring different kinds of observations to bear on the problem, because this is a many-body problem. This is not a two-body problem, and you know, we, we, we make a lot of headway by thinking of it as if it were a two-body problem. But then it's, you know, the, the many-body nature of it enters. And, you know, a molecule is going to be vibrating and rotating and the electron scattering off of something. And so there's, all, there's a new level of complexity. The atom is just sort of stuck there just being a, uh, a plum pudding. <laughs>